Coming up on this episode of the IoT Inc. Business Show. Well, the facts change depending on the case, right? Because like you said, one company might have no screen and another company might have a huge screen. But the standard under the FTC Act, Section 5, remains the same. There, we're looking at deception or unfairness. And so again, for deception, it's did you make a statement and was it false or misleading and was it material to consumers? Lose five pounds of belly fat in five days. Sound too good to be true? Yeah, it probably is. And because of that, you'd expect the FTC to be all over it. But instead of a weight loss product, what about an IoT product? What's fair? What's deceptive? In this episode of the IoT Show, I speak with Jared Ho about the FTC's role in IoT and some guidance to help your company navigate through the gray. All this and more on this episode of the IoT Inc. Business Show. The people, the business, and the technology of the next generation internet. This is the IoT Inc. Business Show. And now, here's your host, Bruce Sinclair. Hello and welcome to the IoT Inc. Business Show. This show is made possible by sales of my book, IoT Inc., published by McGraw-Hill, and the IoT Inc. Certified IoT Professional, or ICIP, online training and certification program. Become a certified IoT professional by completing the program's three courses, ICIP Technology, ICIP Business, and ICIP Strategy and Digital Transformation. Details of which can be found at www.iot-inc.com. That's www.iot-inc.com. With me today on the IoT Show is Jared Ho. Jared is attorney with the Division of Privacy and Identity Protection at the FTC. He previously served as a policy advisor with the Enforcement Bureau at the FCC and as a Deputy Attorney General for the state of New Jersey, where he led his office's privacy and data security efforts. Jared, welcome to the show. Hey, thanks for having me, Bruce. I'm uh, really excited for our conversation today. Yeah, my, myself included. Uh, so has IoT been keeping you busy lately? <laughs> yeah, it's always um, it's, it's always an effort that uh, our agency is constantly working on. Um, you know better than you know me you know, how fast IoT is changing and um, uh, you know, the new and different emerging technologies and issues that constantly come up. Yeah. Now, how, how much of your work from a percentage point of view is on IoT versus, I mean, there's obviously there was a life before IoT. So how, how much of the, your time are you, being, are you spending on IoT? Um, I always feel like that's hard to yeah. say. I, I, work on the, I, I work in the privacy and identity protection group, and a lot of the work that we do has to deal with technology. And when we're talking about technologies these days, I mean, you know, what isn't uh, internet connected? Um, so I'd say, you know, a fairly large portion of it is IoT related. Yeah, well, well why don't we dive into it? If you could uh, give us um, a bit of background on yourself and, yeah, and a background on your work in IoT. Uh, yeah, sure, sure thing. So um, first off, maybe I can just start by giving your standard disclosure Uh-oh. that, um, yeah, the views expressed uh, today are purely my own and don't necessarily reflect those of the Federal Trade Commission or, or any of its uh, individual commissioners. Um, okay, yeah. duly accepted. Uh, you, <laughs> you are an attorney after all, and so I, I think that's uh, that's good. So you state the you state this is is that for your own protection or for the or for the agency's protection? Um, I I, I think possibly you know pro- probably for both. Um, okay. I, I, you know we do we do these uh, uh, on a fairly regular basis, and it's okay. just uh, one of those um, things that you say. All right. Well, let, let's hear let's hear about your your background. I mean, I'm interested. You you obviously have an expertise in IoT. You are highly recommended to me. So, uh, what is your background and 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 what is your work in IoT? Um, so, I'm I'm actually not a technologist by trade. I'm a I'm an attorney by trade. Mm-hmm. And um, but I have been working on uh, you know privacy and data security IoT issues. Um, I'd say maybe for the past uh, eight 
you know, nine years or so, um, you know, first at the attorney general's office. And then um, uh, my first job here at the FTC uh, was actually an attorney in our uh, office of identity, uh, sorry, our office of technology research and investigations. Hmm. Um, And in that group, we primarily focused on um, uh, independent research um, type work. Okay. Okay. And, and like you said, the privacy is just naturally taking you to IoT. When did IoT come on your radar and the FTC's radar? Um, I, I think that's also a hard um, thing to answer as well because it, it sort of is a natural progression. Um, it's uh, you know as technology has progressed, we've gone from you know like the 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 landline telephone to, mm. you know, black and white TVs, to color TVs, to personal computers, to internet connected computers. And so um, I like to think of our work as sort of an evolution that mm-hmm. has um, uh, progressed along with technology. And, you know, I see sort of our work as, you know, standing side by side with um, the advancements that, you know, have, you know, are constantly happening. Um yeah, no, you know, that makes sense. But but, you know, what is confusing to me now, I, I by by no means am I an expert, but the FTC's role, from what I understand, has been more along the lines of, of competition and deceptive advertising. How does that how does that fit with IoT? I mean, they seem almost orthogonal. Um, yeah, I, I'm not sure about orthogonal, but I, I would actually probably characterize our IoT, IoT work as being in line with um, uh, or a component of our, you know, broader consumer protection mission. Mm -hmm. Um, When we're talking about, you know, deceptive advertising, um, you know, you know, a lot of people might, you know, think of like, you know, dietary supplements that, um, uh, you know, people talking about dietary supplements and the efficacy of them. But I mean, those are, those, those are really statements that are made to consumers And that's really the core of uh, our mission is making sure that, you know, statements made to consumers, whether it's about the efficacy of a product or the type of information that's being collected about a product, that that's that statement is uh, truthful. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, I, I think to maybe look forward and look at what's happening today, it's helpful to sort of, you know, look backwards a little bit. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, our agency has you know, had a long history of consumer protection. Um, it was established over a hundred years ago in 1914 um, oh, wow. when okay. Woodrow Wilson, you know, signed the Federal Trade Commission Act into law. And, uh, you know, consumer, you know, protecting consumers in, and competition in the marketplace, um, that mission has stayed the, has stayed the same as sort of technology has, uh, you know, progressed and evolved. Um, I really see... Uh, you know, the FTC is supporting the pillar of innovation and growth mm-hmm. uh, sort of in a way that, you know, protects consumers. So you're yeah. So I, th- I guess is the deceptive advertising that kind of got me confused. What you're saying is more protection. And when you were talking about the health supplements, yeah, that could be deceptive, right? Lose 30 pounds in 30 days. But when it comes to and I, and I guess I'm just going to bring up uh, the most recent, you know, for us right now, we're in February 2017. So recently there was the Vizio TV uh, situation. And in that case, it wasn't so much there or was it, you know, maybe that's the legal definition of what deceptive is. Is, is it that they just weren't, is, is it being deceptive if you don't tell the consumers everything you're going to do? Is that deceptive? The lack of telling them is, is that, <laughs> is that why it fits in or just help me understand that? Okay. Um, Yeah, so maybe I can give a little bit background about our statute and um, our authority under the statute, and then maybe I can bring that together with Vizio and tie that in. Okay. So, you know, under under our act, um, there's a a provision called Section 5, and that uh, prohibits unfair or deceptive acts or practices. Okay. And so it's not only that you know, you, you say something and it's not true and you're liable under the act. You might also be liable under the act if you don't say something and should have said something. Got it. Got it. Or okay. if, um, you know, what you do causes uh, injury to consumers. So um, 
you know, that, that, those are sort of the basic prongs of, you know, our Section 5 authority. But, you know, we have broad jurisdiction, and that basically covers any act or practice interaffecting commerce with mm-hmm. certain exceptions like common carrier. Um, so that that's sort of where we're coming from. So when, when whenever we look at a case, we're looking, you know, is there a deceptive statement or omission that was made mm-hmm. and uh, or oh, was there an unfair act or practice that caused injury or is likely to cause uh, injury to consumers? Okay, um, so the omission is kind of the the key the key term here, then, right? Um, at, at least in the Visio in the Visio scenario. Yeah, so in the Visio scenario, we actually had uh, two counts: one for unfairness, and the second one for a deceptive omission. Oh, so, okay. um, under the unfairness count, uh, you know. So maybe backtracking a little bit, I'm not quite sure how familiar your uh, listeners are with the Vizio case it's, uh, it, itself. But no, maybe uh, give us yeah, give us maybe just a broad uh, overview. Yeah. So you know, Vizio is a TV manufacturer, and uh, in 2014 they began max, uh, manufacturing TVs that continuously uh, tracked what consumers were uh, watching. Um, and they did this on a second by second basis using uh, automated content recognition software or ACR mm. software. Mm. And so this software captured um, information uh, uh, on a certain selection of pixels on the TV screen. And from that sort of selection of pixels on the TV screen, they were able to figure out, you know, what TV show you're watching or what commercial is currently uh, on. And you know, that information would then be sold to, you know, third parties for, you know, audience measurement or yeah, yeah. advertising effectiveness or uh, targeted advertising. Um, so that's sort of the background on, on, on Vizio. So what we said on the unfairness side was that uh, Vizio collected uh, sensitive personal information about consumers, you know, mm-hmm. like their viewing history. Um, in a manner that they wouldn't have expected. Um, and so that's maybe the unfairness prong. Okay. On, the, uh, on the deception side, you know, we alleged that, you know, while the company sort of disclosed that their software would enable, you know, offers or suggestions about what you watched, they didn't adequately disclose. And this is the sort of like the omis- omission part, right? They didn't mm-hmm. like completely disclose, you know, how com- comprehensively uh, the collection was or how comprehensively they were sharing that information about consumers, uh, you know, TV viewing practices. And, and, you know, it's interesting because, and this is, a, uh, it is IOT-ish, because like you said, if you squint your eyes, pretty much everything is. But I can tell you, you know, most of the time I get these disclaimers and they just run on and on on my phone. You know, I'm just like flipping up, flipping up to get to that bottom just to hit I accept or on the same thing on the computer. It's funny that I guess with a with a product like a television, the interface to make that agreement isn't there. Like what is the interface? Because, you know, and this this goes to other type of IoT devices that don't have any inter- interface at all. And so these issues, I guess they get pretty tangled up. Like how do you accept? How would they even present it to you for you to accept? Would you have to sign up on their website? Would you have to mail in something physical? I mean, how, how could they have gotten around this? Um, I, I, you know, I – Maybe you can sort of talk about this more generally, but I think you are right, though. This is sort of one of the big issues related to, you know, IoT. You know, in my mind, IoT, you know, the, the IoT data and privacy security issues really mm-hmm. aren't really that different from the IoT privacy, the, the privacy and security issues related to like a mobile phone or yeah, a yeah. desktop computer. They're, those are, you know, they're privacy cases or they're, you know, data security cases. Yeah, right. Um, I, I, I really, but, but I think you hit the nail on the head what really makes iot different is sort of that there they have there's this patchwork of inconsistent interfaces right i mean you could have a a smartwatch with a tiny screen or a tv with a huge screen but maybe a, a scrolling issue or um you know you might have you know a, a, a phone app which you know has a smaller screen as well and yeah. um, 
I, I think all of those, uh, you know, problems have to be dealt on a case by case basis. Right. Uh, and so it's hard to say with sort of specificity, you know, yeah, yeah. this is the rule for all IoT devices. Because there may not even be a screen at all, right? You know, I'm thinking like yeah. an infrastructure IoT where you're walking down the street now, you know, I mean, or you're walking in front of a retail store or you're walking inside a retail environment. You know, there, there, there isn't even an interface. It's, it's maybe tracking you visually or it's tracking you, you know, in a number of different ways. But there isn't always an interface. And so there has to be some sort of consent. You know, and and maybe you can speak to this, but we hear a lot about privacy. But privacy really is from a company perspective, so for the folks that are listening right now, they're, they're running businesses or they're, you know, in the middle of an IoT business. And what they're really interested in is the liabilities. And privacy is is obviously just one type of liability. But we hear a lot about it, I suppose, because of agencies like the FTC, because you're, you're protecting consumers. In the business environment, it's more contractual. So B2B uh, IoT, there's going to be a contract and in there there's going to be everything. And there's going to be a signing, you know. Uh, as part of the sale, but is that kind of, you know, I guess it's kind of all gray for me as well, but it seems like in that ether, this is where all the challenges are. It's more on the consumer side. So privacy comes up a little bit more than the other types of uh, risks and liabilities. And there isn't, and it's changing. So there isn't always this interface. And so I, I you know, on a case by case basis, it, it's difficult and maybe we'll get to some advice and we will get to some device, some higher level to advice, but how do companies deal with this if it is really on a case by case basis? Well, I, 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 so, you know, the facts change depending on the case, right? Because, you know, like you said, one company might have no screen and, you know, another company might have a huge screen. Hmm. Um, but, you know, the, the standard under the, the FTC Act is, is uh, section five, uh, you know, remains the same. And so there, you know, you know, we're looking at deception or unfairness. And so, you know, again, for deception, it's, you know, did you make a statement um, and did that statement, was it, you know, was it false or misleading and was it material to consumers? Um, if you didn't make a statement, um, you know, did you, you know, omit a material fact that you should have, you know, explained to consumers or, mm -hmm. you know, under the unfairness prong, um, you know, did whatever you did, did it, you know, injure consumers, you know, in a concrete way? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So in the case of the retail store, perhaps what would be sufficient is a big sign as you walked in. I don't know. Maybe if you're walking down the street, that's a little bit more difficult, right? Just if you're, de how do you not be deceptive if you don't have their attention or if you don't have a screen and I guess is this the gray area that just has to be looked at on a case by case basis and just judge reasonably? People just have to use their common sense, or, or are there any other guidelines that you know that people can follow? Mm -hmm. Well, um, so we we do have guidance for companies, and so it's it's not, um, you know, it's not as though they don't have materials to refer to um, okay. so that they have to apply that to you know their their specific product and so you know one example is you know we've given guidance in our um, internet of things report that we published in uh 2015 right, and right. you know that that product was you know that report was a was the product of you know a work workshop that we held um you know where we gathered you know academics and industry experts and consumer protection advocates together to sort of you know discuss these talent challenging yeah. issues of you know what to do with with you know smaller no screens um we've also you know issued the guidance in the past about you know mobile disclosures you know you know and we gave recommendations on uh you know how to effectively you know give consumers information when you have limited screen space and so you can find you know okay. the iot report in our mobile disclosures um you know guidance uh, on our website um, you know, and if businesses are looking for something more specific, um, we also have uh, start with security and uh, careful connections guidance. And that's, you know, IoT specific guidance. Mm -hmm. And it's also um, it gives companies a sense of the lessons that we've learned um, from our past enforcement cases. And so I really would recommend people. You know, companies looking into you know our start with security guidance for 
um, you know, tips. Yeah, yeah, no, Jared, that's that's great, and I'll put those links in the show analysis notes. But I do want to, you know, I do want to pick up on one of those pieces of guidance, and and recently it came to my attention this concept of data minimization, and maybe you need to clarify that. For when I hear that, though, it's saying, you know, it, just take what you need and and nothing more uh, from a data perspective. But that kind of goes counter to where a lot of value is found in IoT, where the data that you collect for, let's say that you you have a television, and let's say that it not only recognizes what channel you're on, but it recognizes whether you're in the room, how many people are watching that show, even who it is. Now, you could just limit that data in a very, very, very minor way to just the people, you know, to just your needs. But that data has value to others. Now, if I guess maybe I'm maybe I'm kind of talking myself into an answer here. But is the solution there that again you just need that explicit consent from the viewers of the television in this particular example, and then you can collect more of that data? Because you know what I'm saying, it's like there is a lot of value in collecting more data in many many IoT products, services, uh, infrastructures, environments than just for their specific terms. So so how do you navigate that? Wanting to monetize extra data versus you know your guidance of saying just just minimize that just collect what you need or or am i interpreting that properly um yeah no because i mean the the, i on on one hand i do sort of completely agree with you on sort of the benefits of you know big data and um you know information like Mm. um it's extremely valuable to not just companies, but consumers as well. I mean, you know, from personal examples, um, you know, innovation and big data have helped me in, you know, so many ways. Mm. Like, I'm not quite sure I could navigate, you know, you know, in my car, you know, driving from <laughs> one part of town to another without, you know, some type of, you know, phone app to help me, you know, I know I could to turn, right? <laughs> and, you know, my, my parents are getting older and, um, it gives me extreme comfort to, um, mm-hmm. when I'm able to sort of turn on the app and watch a live feed of what's going on, you know, um, from the vantage point of their front door. Um, yeah. That wouldn't be possible without, um, you know, IoT and big data. And so, you know, duly noted that that is sort of like an important thing um, to make sure that companies have access to the information that they need to you know, create products for consumers. Yeah, innovate, right. Right, to innovate. And you, you do need that. Um, I think from an enforcement perspective, maybe I can give you like a couple examples of, you mm-hmm. know, cases um, where, you know, companies maybe um, use certain types of data when they didn't have to. Um, okay. So, you know, one example is uh, accretive. And so in that, you know, case, we allege that the company used, you know, people's real person you know real names and personal information in uh in in employee training sessions and they failed to remove that information from you know computers you know after those sessions were over hmm. or you know in uh for you international uh, you know we charged that the company gave access to sensitive consumer data to uh you know service providers uh who were developing apps for companies so you know in in both those cases, you know, you know, the risks, you know, could have been avoided had, you know, these companies used fictitious information for training and, you know, developing type purposes. Um, so, or at least anonymous information, right? I mean, at least anonymizing. I mean, that's a term that's used mm-hmm. often is is anonymizing it or just abstracting it in a way that you still get the essence, but not the PII. Is that what we're talking about here? Um, yeah, no, I think anonymization is, um, you know, a part of the mix that goes uh, that, that mm. certainly goes into it. But um, you, your your point is also well taken too. That you know, at the end of the day, it, it, it comes down to those, you know, you know, two questions again: is it deceptive or uh, is it unfair? So, is there a statement that was made that isn't completely true, or a fact that should have been stated? Um, uh, that would have been material to consumers, um, or was there injury to consumers in some way? 
Now, is everything all forgiven if you are able to get the explicit agreement of the consumer? Now, we're talking consumers and we're not and, and I don't think we'll have time to get into the business side of things. But is everything all good if, if we get that check mark or we get that signature, the electronic signature for the consumer? Can we do whatever we, can can companies do whatever they want or do they still have to think about those two, you know, those those, those two rules that we've been discussing, you know, fairness and and um, and uh, just making sure that it's it's not uh, not not you're not stating yourself accurately. Yeah, and it, it, this is the best part about being a lawyer is you can just constantly say I don't know. It depends. It's case by case. Um, yeah, okay. and, and and part of that is because it depends on uh, you know how you get that check mark from a consumer. Mm. Um, you know the the method you got it. Um, plays into it as well and how prominent the disclosure was to consumers, um, whether or not they um, expected the, you know, type of collection that um, was, you know, happening. So mm-hmm. you know, the, the example again is like Vizio. So when I go to the store and buy a TV, do I necessarily, you know, expect that I bring it home and it's going to, you know, gather pixels to figure out which TV show I'm watching. Um, Probably, probably not unless it was like plastered on the whole box and maybe when you, (laughs) on the startup screen, it came up and, you know, I guess there's that, I guess there's that fine line and and you could argue, you know, for example, you know, the last thing I want to talk about uh, to to be respectful for your time is devices that are listening. And I have a, an Amazon uh, echo at home and what comes with an app. So I don't have to worry about doing a check mark on the physical device. It has an app and you can set settings. But I'm going to tell you, Jared, I mean, that's one of those where I was flipping through pages and pages. It's there. <laughs> I suppose it's up to me to read it. But is that so there's two issues. Is that good enough? If there's like 20 pages of, of this of, of um, conditions that you agree to. Is that is that good enough? I mean, or is that realistic that anyone's going to read that on that app for my Amazon? You know, for my Amazon uh, Echo. Um, you know, I, I always hate to talk about like you know specific products, but um, you know, I I, I think more broadly, um, a, a lot a lot of it, a lot of our work hinges on you know what's what's reasonable and what's reasonable for a consumer mm. and. You know that 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 varies a lot depending on you know sort of the the sensitivity or the volume of information. Um, it also depends on you know the the size or complexity of the data operations or mm. you know um, you know the the different tools that are you know available or sort of you know impacts on business right. And so that sort of goes into the reasonable stand the the reasonable standard that we sort of look at from a data security perspective. Um, I I think what you're talking about, you know, is can you collect that information? And it, it really depends on the sensitivity, right? It's, it's one thing if you're talking about, you know, your medical history, um, Mm -hmm. to, you know, um, you know, what, what's the weather, um, you know, those are two different types of information and, um, the, the prominence of the disclosure, um, really depends on the, the type of collection that's happening. Okay, so there's a balance there. You're saying, mm-hmm. yep, yeah, and so, so, okay, so 20 pages of disclosure might be good enough. Even, well, yeah, I mean, I guess this is where the common sense comes in. But I suppose I should have read it. You know, for whatever product that is, I should have read those 20 pages. But is that, is that, um, you know, is that is that what's what's expected of consumers? And I think what you're saying is it depends <laughs> and it really you have to look at it on a case-by-case basis and i'm just you know i guess i just want to leave our our listeners with with some advice on this and and i'm going to use the example of the home so in the home um there's a lot of vying for who's going to have who's going to own the the smart home platform and before to own that smart home platform you attract the developers really sexy uh UIs and really sexy SDKs and they would develop and now it's becoming clear through a variety of different products that the voice at least today is what's going to control the home so if one let's say that our listeners are saying all right well we want to put a device in the home 
it's listening. Now, it's not medical records, although I suppose people could talk about their medical you know, situation. But using that as an example, a hypothetical example, it's really, really, would be really, really valuable to listen. I don't know, maybe not store, but listen at all times because that's a, a fantastic type of interface that's been demonstrated by a number of different products. What's the situation there? I mean, is because in, from an innovation point of view, listening could be really valuable. It could offer some real valuable value to the consumer, but at the same time, it's definitely a privacy issue. So what's your take, what's your take on that situation? Um, I guess my take on it is it's, it's one thing if you bring something into the house and, you know, you set it on mm. your kitchen table and you say, you know, listen to me, then right. in, in, in that case, you, you know, absolutely what it's doing. It's, it's listening to you. It's, I think it's another story when you buy a house and, mm. you know, you, you walk through the front door and all of a sudden the house is listening to you. Um, so I, I guess my take is that, you know, a, a part of it depends on sort of the expectation of consumers. And then, um, you know, the other part is, you know, what type of, you know, notice or consent do you have to uh, gather, um, from consumers? So, you know, it, it, in the, in the tabletop example, the, um, the, the notice and dis the notice and consent model is very mm -hmm. different than the, you know, walking into the house model, like in the right. walking in the house model, maybe, you know, it might not be expected. So you might need some more robust disclosure. Mm -hmm. So again, again, what you're saying is there's an expectation that it's listening to you. Um, you still need to get that sign off that check mark um, from the user, but it's contextual. And I guess this, this falls back to the, it depends uh, line here, but it's contextual and depending on the product and depending on the situation, uh, it sounds like, all right, well, I mean, I think, I, I think what we're going to have to leave everyone with is that you have to use common sense. You have to look at what the guidance is that's out there today. And we'll list that on the show analysis notes from the, F, you know, from the FTC and, um, and it's changing, right? It's evolving. And so really the impetus is going to be on, on the business people to keep on top of this. So beyond uh, beyond uh, the website and those reports, how do people keep on top of it? And um, and maybe we'll just sort of leave it with that. Is what's the what's the, what's your advice for everybody to keep on top as as this technology develops and as the government's trying to uh, create you know frameworks to keep up with it to protect consumers? What's your what's your final advice for 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 the uh, makers of IoT devices and how they should just make sure they're not you know, they're not, they're not getting into trouble. Um, well, so our agency uh, on, on a daily basis puts out, um, you know, ad advice for businesses. Um, it's, you know, our, we have a business education blog that companies mm. go, go to for more information and you can actually sign up for the, you know, newsletter. Um, uh, so that might be a, you know, tour okay. source for, uh, you know, businesses to go to stay on top of uh, what's happening in uh, IoT privacy and data security. All right, Jared. Well, thanks for your time. And um, and I wish there were some clear, crisper answers. But I think, you know, where we are right now, at least at this point in time, uh, I think we're just going to have to make do with with common sense and as and just keeping on top of things as best we can. I appreciate your time. Thank you, Bruce. OK. That was a good talk with Jared Ho. This podcast goes vertical, deep diving into different topics each week. If you prefer a more horizontal and structured approach to learning IoT business and its orbiting technologies, check out my book, IoT Inc., published by McGraw-Hill, or become a certified IoT professional by completing the ICIP training and certification program. For details, just go to www iot-inc.com. Also go to www.iot-inc.com for an analysis of this episode, links to things that were mentioned during the episode, and very importantly, the episode's PDF transcript. Just search for the name of the episode or the guest. If you're new to this podcast, subscribe. That way you'll get every week's episode delivered straight to your device. Or if you've been listening for a while, there are three ways you can support the show. You can leave a rating or a review on iTunes. 
just go to iot-inc.com slash iTunes. It only takes one click to leave a rating, a little bit longer to leave a review. You can share it on social. I'm on LinkedIn, to a lesser extent, on Twitter. And of course, you can support this show by buying my book, IoT Inc., or the ICIP Training and Certification Program. It's how I pay the bills. Next week's episode is the GDPR, Defining the Future of IoT Data Privacy, with Rosie Burbridge. I hope you could join me then. I'm your host, Bruce Sinclair. Thank you for listening. Until next week, may your path to IoT business be a reasonable one. You have been listening to the IoT Inc. Business Show. 